All right, friends, it is time to hear from the amazing Carrie Tomlinson. So we regularly get requests for more marketing, more communications, more information on how to speak to our employees. In fact, the, the uh, 2021, excuse me, SANS report showed that less than 20% of respondents had a quote unquote non-technical background. Um, specifically thinking about things like marketing and communications. So we, of course, wanted to invite the fantastic Carrie in. She is an expert in communicating our key messages in an engaging way. And so we are thrilled to have her join us today. Without further ado, Carrie, please take it away. Thank you so much. And I hope that you all can see my screen there. That's me, Carrie Tomlinson, cyber news reporter, Ampere News. 30 years in TV news, winning Emmys and more local, regional, and national awards. Why is this all so important? Well, one, so you know who's talking, but also because this could be titled Secrets of TV News and How to Make Them Work for You in Your Security Awareness Program. Because what I did every day in TV news for 30 years are the same things that you can be doing with your security messages to help people embrace them, understand them, love them, work with them, and do great things. So let's get started talking about the curse of knowledge. What is it? Well, the curse of knowledge short definition is you know too much. There's the movie from the 50s, Alfred Hitchcock, The Man Who Knew Too Much. But basically the idea is that you know a lot about something and that is great, but you have trouble remembering what it was like to not know a lot about something. And it's hard to explain that to someone who is in that position of being a beginner. And this can cause a lot of frustrations. Let's talk about the curse of knowledge in everyday life. For example, you deal with the curse of knowledge in the game of charades. In fact, the game of charades is all about the curse of knowledge where you're trying to communicate something to somebody who doesn't know what the heck you're doing. Also, the curse of knowledge can come up, for example, when you're writing notes to yourself, maybe you write on your hand, hey, notify about that meeting, and then a day later or even a few hours later, maybe you don't remember what the meeting was about. Another situation is you go to the doctor and you say, doctor, my finger hurts, and the doctor says, well, you have a severed mandibular clavicular formula in your finger, and you say, what does that mean? Oh, you broke your finger. The doctor has a lot of knowledge and wants to be able to share that knowledge with you, but you are not ready to accept it. You don't know enough. And another example that I see a lot, especially with my kids who are huge basketball fans, they get very frustrated when I cannot name all, say, the Celtics players dating back to 1972 because they love basketball and know so much information they really can't fathom that someone else would not know the same amount of information that they do and also not be fascinated by the same amount of information. So this can become a problem when it comes to security awareness. The curse of knowledge can make people grumpy. And we have this great grumpy cat meme that really is exemplifies this. I tried to sit, but I didn't fit. This is your audience. The audience is trying to, in this case, sit in your message, understand your message, but it doesn't fit them. It doesn't fit them because you are at a level that is much, much higher than they are. And this can be a death knell for security awareness programs, because if they're not understanding what you're saying, then they're grumpy. And they have actually done studies on this. Researchers have done studies on this. And what they find is that the curse of knowledge has more impacts than just people getting grumpy. Your audience will have greater resistance to persuasion, meaning you're trying to persuade them of a security message, but because of the curse of knowledge, because you know too much, because you're not explaining it in a way that they can understand and enjoy, they're just not gonna do what you want. In addition, another layer is there is lower support for adoption of technology. Now think about that if you are trying to get someone to use say a password manager or multi-factor authentication, the curse of knowledge could be 
preventing you from convincing people that this is the right thing to do. So we're learning that the curse of knowledge can really be a terrible curse. Lance Spitzner told me it is one of the leading reasons that awareness programs fail the curse of knowledge. So we really want to defeat this. Also talking with Lance about this talk, he said, make sure that you define what the curse of knowledge is, because wouldn't that be funny if you do a talk about the curse of knowledge and you just assume that everyone knows what the curse of knowledge is and you don't explain it. And then your talk is afflicted with the curse of knowledge and people come away grumpier. So I looked up the definition for curse of knowledge on Wikipedia and it says, the curse of knowledge is a cognitive bias that Whoa, whoa, wait a second. Cognitive bias. Now, I took psychology classes in college. So technically, I do know what a cognitive bias is. But if I'm just casually reading and someone throws out cognitive bias, suddenly I'm saying, okay, do I know exactly what that is? Cognitive, okay, so it's a psychological bias. So I am derailed from even understanding this definition of the curse of knowledge by the curse of knowledge. The definer is assuming that I know what a cognitive bias is. And I, I, I do, but I'm thrown by it. This is a great example of what we're trying to avoid when we do our security awareness programs so that we don't even derail person and getting to the, as someone from getting to the end of the message because we're busy using terms that people don't understand. So the reaction that people have to the curse of knowledge when your message is afflicted by it is, it's too hard. I just, I don't get it. And in addition, I don't like it. And that's where Grumpy Cat really comes in. Grumpy Cat is really grumpy about this message and is not interested in what you have to say. So what to do? What can we do so we don't destroy our security awareness programs? and we do help our audience understand what is going on. The very first thing that you want to do is ask this one question, who is your audience? And I don't mean like their names like Cassie or Lance or Jennifer. I mean, in general, who are they? And why is this important? Because it is really all about your audience. They are the number one thing. It's not how smart you are. It's not the information that you have to give. It's your audience. Taking a look at the TV news audience will help you understand. So 30 years in TV news, we were trained to know our audience. Our audience is distracted. They're making dinner. They're helping kids with homework. They're busy talking about what the news reporters are wearing. And I know because I get lots of viewer mail about what I'm wearing or how my hair is looking or that particular thing for the day. Also, your audience for TV news is very busy. They're making dinner. They're helping kids with homework. They're getting ready to walk the dog. They're thinking about what's going to happen after dinner. So they have other things on their mind. They also really are very ready to change the channel at any time, like you see in this picture, changing to Netflix, because they'd rather be watching a movie. And in addition to that, the TV news audience comes from all education levels, all viewpoints, all walks of life. If you embrace this concept for your audience, you will have an easier time. Your audience is distracted. They're working on things with work. They've got many projects to do. Cybersecurity is not necessarily a priority. They're busy. And guess what? Their projects to them take priority over cybersecurity, as you probably already know. In addition, they are ready to change the channel at any time because we've kind of trained people in the past that cybersecurity is boring. In fact, when I launched my first cyber news channel six years ago, my aunt, who is very high up in municipal, um, how to say it, infrastructure at a very large city on the West Coast, and also very technical, by the way, said, Carrie, no one cares about cybersecurity. And, and she's right. Uh, they don't. And we have had to work to change that. And we are actively working to change that. And this presentation, hopefully, is a good step forward into changing that. Now, you do have an advantage over the TV news audience in that generally, your audience is your same company, perhaps they have the same interest area, maybe they work in the same department, maybe they all showed up at a brown bag lunch when we used to do those. 
and they may have had an interest in cybersecurity. So you may be able to have a slight advantage and that you have some common ground with these folks. But here's what you want to think. Besides knowing your audience has all those characteristics, you also need to think of them as good people. There is a certain disdain that people with a lot of technical knowledge sometimes have for people who don't have technical knowledge. The feeling that they are ignorant, I've seen that, that word used, for example, on forums when I'm searching for answers to a technical issue in some piece of software that I'm using. There is a disdain, there's the word ignorance, because you don't know what other people know. We need to erase that, and this, this is why. They're good people, they're imperfect, but they're trying. They're also knowledgeable in other areas. For example, when my kids like to say, well, you're dumb because you don't know who the Phoenix Suns top assistant coach is for basketball. And I say, I don't, but I am fluent in Spanish and Russian. So you see, I have knowledge in other areas. Now my kids actually are impressed by that, surprisingly as teenagers, uh, but I want you to remember that when you're talking to your audience, that they are knowledgeable in lots of areas. They are not, not smart because they don't know the technical knowledge that you have. That doesn't make them bad people in any way. Okay, we're going to break down some barriers in the curse of knowledge. And one of them is too much information. So how does it work? Well, I'd like to take you through a TV news exercise, something that I had to do every single day for 30 years sometimes on weekends as well, because you often work seven days a week. And we're going to look at how the curse of knowledge works and look at a strategy to overcome it. So we have a fire. There's a fire on 6th and Main here. You see the picture coming in. And this is the info that's coming into your newsroom. It's at an old hotel at 6th and Main in downtown Springfield. The fire crews are on their way. I guess what, your chopper is on the way too. It is the eyewitness live action new Sky Star 3 team witness action chopper. Woohoo! So it's pretty easy to write this little story about what's happening. A building is burning in downtown Springfield tonight at 6th and Main. Fire crews are on their way. So is our helicopter crew. We'll have more information for you soon. So that's great. Well, now we're going to see what really happens next. So you get a call. It's the chopper captain. Hey, it's Captain Sarah from the chopper. It's the old empty Dr. Jekyll Toys Factory that's burning. It was very popular, a popular local business in its day. Frankenhorse was their top seller. You see him there, a toy beloved by many, sold 40 million before the factory closed in 2010. So that's interesting, good information. But now we're going to get another call. The fire chief is calling. Fire chief here. There are four fire crews on scene. They're using the brand new million dollar blue fire truck for the first time got a flat tire as soon as it arrived it has two more hoses than the other trucks nobody's hurt okay also good information but now we're we're getting more coming in the mayor is calling the news desk hands you a note you say well, what's up they say the mayor called there's a lot of smoke the fire is mostly out traffic is stopped there's an evacuation order for buildings nearby it's after 5 p.m this is a mixed business district the toy factory used to make airplane parts in world war ii by the way isn't that interesting okay you're starting to get overwhelmed with a lot of information because you know you have to process all of this but then your reporter calls i'm on scene a crowd has gathered an old legend has it that the building was cursed because the owner insulted frankenhorse calling him just another zombie pony rude. Now the owner has shown up. Some people are yelling at the owner. Some also showed up. Someone also showed up in a Frankenhorse costume handing out lollipops. Okay, by now you're overwhelmed with a ton of information. You have a very short time, just a few minutes to process all of this and put this into a meaningful story for your viewers. So this is a strategy that I used and still use, and a strategy that you can try as well. This is a way to overcome this curse that you have. Now you have all this information and somehow you have to tell this story to someone who doesn't know anything about this, may or may not know what Frankenhorse is, may or may not know anything about the curse. So what are you going to do? Well, let's try this strategy and see if this works for you. And I added a little a few spins here so we can have the spinning thing just like the old newspapers. 
just for fun so we can see what's going on. Okay, so we can try this strategy. The strategy is make a meal out of your message. So what the heck does that mean? We're gonna start, we're gonna grab a piece of paper and a pen or laptop and fingers, and we're going to categorize the information that we have. And once you get used to this, you can do this really quickly. And this will help you shape your message for people who don't know what's going on. Start with your entree. This is the basic information, the protein, if you will, the basic facts that we need to know to get this information across. Number two are your side dishes, the mid-range information that isn't just absolutely crucial. Basic, maybe you don't need all of it, maybe you need some of it, you can pick and choose. And then finally, the dessert, which is the details, you could also call it the appetizer. And those are the fun details that make the story interesting, make your message interesting and compelling and the kinds of things that people will talk about. And when we go through this, when we analyze this, we are thinking of all of these in terms of our audience, who they are, what they need to know, how this information impacts them. It's not about me and making myself look smart with a bunch of knowledge. It's about helping other people. So for example, with the entree, the basics, we have the location, the fire downtown at 6th and Main at the old Dr. Jekyll Toys building. We also need to know, people need to know, is the fire out? Well, the fire is mostly out, but there's a lot of smoke. People will be seeing the smoke in the sky. And also we need to know the status of people. Very important, there's an evacuation order in effect and that impacts people's lives. So we need to get that information out. We also wanna tell everybody, hey, nobody was hurt in all of this. So those are your basics, the main facts you have to get across. We'll look at the side dishes, the mid range. These are things that you can pick and choose from to help build out your message. In this case, traffic has stopped in this mixed business district. Traffic stopped, that's important because people might be driving downtown. They might be trying to pick someone up, say from the evacuation, or maybe since it's a mixed business district, they were thinking of going to a restaurant. Well, they need to know that that might be pretty difficult right now. Other interesting information, the crowd is gathered outside, including the owner. So. If you have been following this issue or you are curious about what is happening, you would like to know if the owner somehow has some responsibility. So we're thinking about the audience and people are angry yelling at the owner. So there's a controversy that's brewing in your downtown. Helpful information, perhaps if you have a business downtown or you live nearby, you'd like to know if there is some kind of controversy. And we look at the dessert, the fun details, also potentially the appetizer, the Frankenhorse curse, that's fun and fascinating. The popularity of the toy, the fact that it sold 40 million units, that means it's likely that some of your audience has that toy, had that toy, or knows someone who has or had that toy, the history of the factory, and also, Say the city just spent millions of dollars on that new blue fire truck and it shows up and it gets a flat tire first thing. Well, that certainly impacts people and their dollars and how they are spent. So with all of this, you have now mapped out your message and you can move the pieces around to make a message that is meaty, filled with protein, not necessarily meat protein for the vegans, but also has some interesting dishes and some things on the side that will help them digest your message in a way that helps you separate yourself from the information. The information is no longer stuck inside you in a swirl, a curse of knowledge swirl. It is now down on paper and mapped out, and you can use that to create something that is helpful for people. Another huge wall when it comes to the curse of knowledge is too much terminology. This is a very large problem. And the picture that I'm going to show you is German typeface. So it's sort of backwards and upside down and in German. And this is a good example of what people see and hear when you use terminology that they don't understand. For them, it's like the upside down and backwards German. Using too much terminology that people don't understand has big impacts. Think about this when you decide to use the terminology or not in your message. Studies show that people who come away with, uh, after reading an article with too much terminology, have a lower understanding of what's going on. So you think that you're helping by teaching them 
terminology, but it has the opposite effect. In addition, as we mentioned before, it creates greater resistance to persuasion, the message you're trying to get across. And as we mentioned, it creates lower support for adopting technology, which is probably what you want them to do. And this last thing is really the most important part. It creates a lower sense of belonging. They feel like they do not belong in whatever community this is. That is the opposite of what we are trying to create in the cybersecurity awareness community. We are a team. We want people to belong. This is the way that we will get people to try new behaviors that will make them safer, us safer, the world safer, the company safer, everyone safer, is if we feel like we belong. So when you decide to write a security message and you have some sort of terminology in there, you need to pause and say to yourself, this terminology actually works against me. It does the opposite of what I'm trying to do. So what can we do? Well, there are solutions, luckily, for this. First off, researchers have created a tool called the de-jargonizer. This picture is actually a steampunk time machine. Sadly, it doesn't work. But this is what I envision when I think of a de-jargonizer. I think of some sort of machine that will help process and take out the jargon, the terms that people probably don't understand in our communications. Sadly, I tested this tool out and it's not necessarily good for our purposes. It was created by researchers for scientists, for people in science to use when they are creating presentations or papers or articles and they can put in words or a paragraph and the de-jargonizer will analyze it and tell them which terms may not be understood by their audience. The problem with this is that what they used for their data set was articles from the BBC. And articles from the BBC may or may not be the best choice for our needs in the cybersecurity awareness community. I tried putting in the word malware. It said people will 100% understand what the word malware is. And I can guarantee you that's not true. As someone who has done many, many news stories with the words malware in it, you need to be very careful because even a word like that is a word not everyone is aware of. So what to do? If you can't use this de-jargonizing tool, then you need to be your own de-jargonizer. How do we do that? Let's do it. Well, first of all, you need to build in time for de-jargonizing. Don't discount it. It's actually a very important step for you. So make sure that you actually maybe even put that on your to-do list. You also want to review every word of what you're saying. And by the way, I have created a document for you, a PDF for you for this entire presentation. So you can relax and enjoy the presentation and not necessarily take notes because afterwards I will have a nice sheet for you. So review every word and look for those keywords like malware that to you seem obvious and say, wait a second, will everyone know that word? Chances are, there will be people who don't. What can you do? Well, you can try concepts, not terminology. For example, do you need to say the word malvertising? Because a lot of people don't know what malvertising is. Can you say something instead like online ads that attackers use to attack you? That's a bit wordy. You might be able to refine it. That was just something I came up with off the top of my head. But what the studies show is that explaining the concepts has much more success than using a term and trying to force it on people. What they found is that even if you have a term and you have a hyperlink where people can click on that term, they are still less likely to enjoy it, understand, and feel like they belong. So your goal will be to explain the concept in your message rather than using terminology. You can also try using a term and then explaining it. But I do have to say, I am studying a third language now, Arabic. And what I have learned is that a lot of Arabic teachers on YouTube want to teach you the Arabic words for each term of grammar. 
And what I've found is that I learn the grammar way easier without learning the term past participle, whatever it is they're trying to say. I can learn it better. And I think that can really inform what you're doing and trying to say. Do you need to teach someone what the word malvertising is? Do they need that in their daily life? And will they be using it in six months? If not, do they really need to know what that term is? Maybe, maybe not. And I know we're trying to be not wordy, but replacing one word like malvertising with a string of words will actually make you succeed rather than make your life difficult. You want to avoid acronyms, although you are very familiar with the acronym because you use it. All of this, this terminology is shorthand for people who work in the business. And we're used to using acronyms, but acronyms will trip people up and they will start to dismiss what you're saying. So in print, the standard is that you write out something like National Institutes of Health, and then you go to NIH. With a lot of the cybersecurity terms, if you do that, people really will not be able to quickly go back and reference what you're saying. So you would be better off either writing out the full phrase every time or writing a shortened version of that phrase or using something to replace that phrase. I would worry less about wordiness and worry more about using acronyms like the word cognitive or the phrase cognitive bias that will trip people up and make them not want to continue with what you're saying. And then something that I think about all the time that I think will help you is real viewer email. When I worked in TV news, I received thousands of letters and phone calls and emails, some of them positive, some of them from angry people. Usually people had some sort of problem that they wanted me to help them solve. And one unit I worked in was the problem solvers where I actually helped people. But they used to write all kinds of wonderful things like, I watch you every morning on the news. The problem is that I didn't work the morning shift. I worked the afternoon and evening shift. So they definitely didn't watch me every morning on the news. That was just made up. I got arrested for reckless driving after the crash. Notice the spelling of reckless. It actually means the opposite of what they're trying to say. How could they have a crash if they didn't have a wreck? Very cute. And then this one is very sweet. A woman wrote this about her husband. She wrote, my husband is the sweetest in a very long letter where she spelled the word husband like this completely all the way through, H-U-S-B-U-N. And from the context of the message, I learned that she truly believed that is the way you spell husband, the word husband. And I thought that was very sweet. In fact, I call my partner now, sometimes my husband, because it is just adorable. But this is important because we need to remember that your audience, besides being distracted and busy and wanting to change the channel and doing all kinds of other stuff, also sometimes they just have a brain space. Sometimes they just forget stuff. And you want to try to reach everyone, even when we're having a brain space. If I sat down and thought about it, I would say, okay, cognitive bias, I know what that is. That's a, a thinking bias that I have. But I'm also having kind of a brain space. I'm trying to look things up quickly and, and maybe something else is going on. You want to craft your message for everyone. Remember, we are respecting them. They are good people. They are knowledgeable in other areas. They're not dumb at all. But sometimes they have brain spaces and we have to account for all of that. Simplify without making it ridiculous. You don't want to treat them like little children. You want to treat them like smart people who know a lot about something else. So you can remember that, the real viewer email. Okay, getting down to the final parts here. And once again, there is a PDF document coming your way if you would like all of this summarized for you in a nice, tidy little document. You want to help people understand and care. I hope this picture is a nice example of caring because, oh my gosh, the lion is about to eat the little girl. This is, of course, a fake photo, photoshopped, but it does help people care about what's going on. It grabs their attention and you want to do things to get their attention and help them care and understand about what you're trying to say about cybersecurity. A great tool for that 
real life stories and events, because if it happens to someone else, it seems more likely that it will happen to me. Remember, a lot of people still will dismiss things, but it's a lot more real than a hypothetical story. If you come up with a fake story or you say, let's say blah, 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 it's really more real if you use a real life one. I've seen a lot of people in the SANS forum gathering real life stories. That is a fantastic idea. Try to find common ground with your audience. For example, is there a frustration that a lot of people have around a certain cybersecurity issue? Is there something that people are happy about? For example, if passwords go away, uh, that would be a wonderful thing. So you can reach some common ground with your audience with the concept of, well, we all wish passwords would go away, but in the meantime, we have to do this, that kind of concept. You want to try to find an area where you both relate together. Make it personal, make it about them. When I first started at my cybersecurity news organization, coming up on seven years ago, I think it was, the concept was no, for cybersecurity awareness, you only talk to employees about corporate security because I'm not paying people to talk about personal security. Now we know that's wrong, that if you show people how they can care about their personal security, they are more likely to care about security on all levels in their life. Use stories about people. If you do a story about a company, oh my gosh, this company had to pay $10 million for ransomware. It is impactful, but you really need it to be about the people and not about the company because we all relate more to actual people. The final thing is let them know you care. And I don't mean say, hey, I care about you. That's pretty tacky, usually falls flat. It's like when corporations have a breach and they say, uh, customer security is our number one priority. You have to let them know you care in your approach to them and where they are in their security journey. That's how you show you care. Not by saying you're ignorant because you don't know these technical terms. You're not technical, but we are a team. We are here to help you. We are going to go through this together. That's what I did in TV news. My theory was that I am helping people travel through this information journey. We're doing it together. We're a team. Things not Mary, so helpful. Yes. It pains me so much to stop this because I am in love with this talk. However, we are a couple of minutes over your time. Oh, golly. Okay. But it was such incredible information. It was hard to not just get sucked into it. This was okay. Fantastic. Well, I apologize for going on in my rehearsals. I was a very tidy, <laughs> I was a very tidy 22 minutes in my rehearsals. Well, we've come about to the end of it. There are some a few things that are in the PDF that people can learn about to help you evaluate your own communications and how to use real life examples. So let's do that. And thank you so much for listening. I really enjoyed it. And I hope that you were able to get something out of it.